Hello and welcome. This is class number 57 of the UPSC Mains Answer Writing Initiative, a place where we are trying to simplify Mains Answer Writing for you. There is an important change that we are making in this series from today onwards. Till today, in the first 56 classes, what we have done is we have taken a previous year question that the UPS has already asked from 2023 or 2022 and tried to write an answer to that. And then in the end, I give you a homework. As many of you have also asked, that sir, why are we doing this? Because UPSC will not repeat its questions. So even if we are prepared with 22 or 23 questions, it will not really help us. Fine. So now what we'll be doing is rather than solving a question that UPSC has asked in 2022 or 2023, we will rather take up a practice question. So I will take up questions from some of the topics that are in the news that are relevant that may be asked in the examination. So now rather than discussing a previous year question that UPS has already asked because it won't repeat, we'll take up new questions that they have not asked. And in the end, I'll give you a homework as well. So this is a change that we are making. Please stay tuned for the series every day at 7 p.m. Sometimes it may go live at slightly after 7, just like today, we are slightly late on this. If you are new here, please do hit the subscribe button before we begin. Also to help you master mains answer writing, we have started our new Mastering UPSC Answer Writing program. A lot of you have very happily joined the program. We have started this program for 2024 batch, for 25 batch. It's a 20 week program that begins on 10th of July. It's a one on one mentorship program where I'm mentoring you on how to write answers in a lot of detail. If you want any more details, if you have any more questions about this program, here is my number and my email ID, which you can contact on whenever you want to. If you are new here, Again, reminding you, if you don't know how and where to begin answer writing, I would suggest you to go to the description of this video, go to the link of the playlist and go to class number one. The name of the playlist is UPSC Mains Answer Writing Initiative. Go to class number one. There you will find I have discussed the structure of answer writing, how to write the intro, the main body, the conclusion. I've discussed each and everything there. Please make sure that you are well versed with that and then we can begin. So let's see what question are we taking up today. Again, as I reminded you, we are not taking up a previous year question from today onwards. From today onwards, we are taking a practice question or a model question that may have a probability of being asked this year or later. So today's question is from GS2. The question is on the topic of pressure groups. The question is how do pressure groups and interest groups impact policy making in India? Evaluate their influence, highlighting both the potential benefits and drawbacks they bring to policy making process. So question is straightforward about the pressure groups. What are pressure groups? These are informal groupings that as the name suggests, try to put pressure on the government. How and why? They put pressure on the government either to pass a certain law or not pass a certain law. There are examples in both. For example, the Lokpal bill. The Lokpal bill was passed in 2013. The president of India gave us it in 2014. The Lokpal came into picture. This entire Lokpal bill was forced upon the government in a way because of this huge Annazari agitation in, a, in which a group called India Against Corruption was involved. Many of the people like Arvind Kejriwal, Kiran Bedi, etc. were involved here. Then there is another example of pressure group trying to force the government not to pass a certain law. Think about the farm protest. The government passed the three farm bills, but because of this long held farmer protest, they took back the bill. So these are opposite examples to prove how pressure groups work. There are many other pressure groups like the big industrial houses that we have in India. They are almost always in touch with the government because they want policies favorable to them to be passed by the government. That is how pressure groups and interest groups usually work. In India, they are not formally recognized. So in India, you don't have an association or an authority that is called a pressure group officially. There are many organizations that work as a pressure group, many NGOs, many associations, many unions, they work as a pressure group. In the US, for example, or other Western countries, there are official pressure groups. Like in the US, there's a very famous pressure group called the National Rifle Association, NRA, which has been extremely successful in not allowing the US government to make it stricter to buy weapons in the US. In the US, as you know, buying a weapon, buying a gun is extremely easy. So this is what we have to write. First, we have to write about how do they impact policy making, and then we have to write about their positive and their negative impact. So this is what the question is about. So we'll start with the introduction. 
intro as you know has to be a fact or a definition now you can't really write any fact as such about pressure groups either if they were in the news if there is something very specific about them in the news then you can give that fact it's not really a law so you can't really write about when the law was passed so it's better to give a definition now apart from giving definition in the intro itself we will try and answer the first part the first part was how do they impact policy making so we'll try and cover that up in the intro itself that is these organizations represent specific segments of the society they exert influence on policy makers to achieve the desired outcomes they often seek to influence policies to lobbying advocacy that is how they usually fall so again we have given the intro and we have answered the first part of the question the intro itself that is how do they influence policy making the second part was about the impact both positive and negative so we'll start with the positive impact and again there are innumerable positive impacts you can write in your own language we have started with first they represent diverse interest for example the farmer interest as we saw they were successful in their way in forcing the government to take back the farm laws they also ensure that they provide expertise and information for example the industrial groups such as the cii and fiki they help the government policy makers in contributing well to their policy making especially economic policy making then we also have these pressure groups helping raise awareness and increase engagement by the public as well these include environmental groups for example you have the narmada bachao andolan they were instrumental in the government or stalling the making of the sadar sarovar dam there are other ngos such as the green peace etc they also play an important role so this is the positive side of it again these are not the only ones you can write some others as well depending on whatever you feel is correct on the other hand there are negative impacts first they have a narrow focus rather than thinking about the larger public interest they are specifically concerned with their own benefit as every group would be they are concerned with how they would benefit they are concerned with how their interests are met they are very powerful lobbies for example the tobacco industry they have influenced policy makers to make sure that tobacco etc is not banned despite well known impact on health these kind of items are not banned in india in equality of influence or they have more influence over policy makers as compared to some of the other groups they are the privileged section of the society they have power they have influence they have financial muscle and thus they can influence the government more it also leads to policy fragmentation why see the policies are made in a much larger level look at the farm bills the farm bills let's assume they were a result of the government thinking and the government deciding on a long term policy but under pressure when the government has to take back a policy or under pressure the government has to compulsorily introduce a policy what happens as a result is that the government is not really making a long term policy and that becomes a problem and this is why this policy fragmentation remains a big issue these were the positive and the negative impact and we can conclude about how their contribution can lead to an informed and much more representative policy but in a democracy we cannot allow non representative members or we cannot allow people from the civil society who are not representing the people officially to get so much power so there has to be a balance between the two at the end of the day in a democracy the elected government will only make the laws but you have to keep them on toes by putting pressure on them so there has to be both sides of the story balance this is how we'll conclude it so they said from today onwards we'll be taking a model question something like this which can be asked by the upsc now time for homework this is your homework how is the increasing influence of regional powers and blocks transforming the global landscape analyze the potential consequences this shift may have on established multilateral organizations such as the united nations it has to be written in 200 words it's a question from ir that is the gs2 part see if you can write this i'll be happy to evaluate this if you want to send this across this is my email id do send me your answers again we are revamping this series on today onwards to make it even more effective so please do be regular here and invite your other friends as well thank you so much do the subscribe button as well bye bye jai hind